Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Meg Malone, and um, I'm not on video. That's I correct. Guess. We've just got oh, well. the slides. Well, imagine all, all of you who are here. I have combed my hair, and I have a beautiful view of the Potomac behind me. Um, so hi everybody i'm really psyched to be here with all of you and with my friends and colleagues from hawaii and i'm a little nervous to be the first presenter because this is the basis for all the rest of them um, so i've set this up so that it has a few quizzes so even though there are a whole bunch of people here there's some interaction um, so i'm just going to get started and we'll have some time for uh, chat questions at the end right stephen okay so um, I am at the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, and I'm also the director of the um, Assessment and Evaluation Language Resource Center at Georgetown. So I wear two hats, and um, that's part of the reason I really like to work with uh, teachers and other language professionals to help understand the basics of assessment. So the first thing we're going to do here is review the fundamental concepts in language assessment. I have included some real world scenarios to apply them because I think that makes it much more meaningful to you all. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but more illustrative of a few things that might happen to you as you move through uh, language teaching and assessment. Um, another purpose is to provide some background to support your upcoming sessions. So I tried to use very commonly used definitions and to avoid nuance and to just be very clear so that as you go through this um, whole set of units that you have a good background to bring from, uh, to draw from. And then finally, I've included some relevant resources in the ongoing um, materials and some discussion questions. So I am going to continue if this seems clear. Okay, and we can't discuss this, but the first thing I want you to do is just think about the best assessment experience you ever had as a learner. So everybody take a minute and just think about the best experience you had. All right, now I want you to think about the most challenging assessment experience you had as a learner. What made that challenging? How did you feel before, during, and after it? Okay, then for those of you who teach languages who are on here, I want you to think about the best assessment experience you had as a teacher. Um, Okay, then I want you to think about the most challenging experience you had as a teacher. What made it challenging? Was it the test? Was it the environment? Was it the students? Was it a combination of these things? Was it because you planned too much and you didn't have time? Just think about what made it so challenging. Okay. And I want you to think about what was in common here. Um, for me, I think the best experience I had as a learner was when um, I'd had a really rough week. Um, in, in assessment and when I was in college and I took this um, the Spanish test and I prepared for it with a friend of mine who was a major and I was really worried about how I was going to do and at the end I realized because um, I prepared properly and I was really ready I really did well in the test and I walked out of it feeling great and I felt even better when I got my grade um, I think the most challenging assessment experience I've had as a teacher is when um, I gave a midterm to my students and some of them left and they just felt so discouraged. And what was interesting is they all did really well. So a lot of it's about expectations for me. Okay. So let's move on. So it's time for you to take a poll. I don't really like to let people sit still too long without participating. Um, so is the poll ready, Stephen? Oh, yay! These guys are the best. So I'd like you to all take this poll. Have you ever taken a test that gave you an unexpected result? Yes, no, or I don't know. So real quick, take the quiz, uh, the poll, sorry. And I'm going to take it right here too to move it along the screen. Okay, is the poll all done? Yeah, I think we've got a lot of results, and here are the here they wow. are. Wow! 
Look at that. So a lot of you have taken a test that gave you an unexpected result. What I really should have asked was good or bad, but I just want you to think about this as we move through all of this. We're going to be talking about a lot of content and um, I want you to just think about um, what you think contributed to that unexpected result and then how you felt. It's really important to think about um, how tests have an impact and an influence on students. Okay. All right. So let's keep moving. Hmm. Okay, so what are the fundamental concepts that we're going to talk about? One is ethics. I am not going to, because we only have, um, we don't have very much time, so I'm going to give you a little introduction to ethics, and I've provided some reading materials on ethics, but I think without ethics, the rest of it really doesn't matter. If a test doesn't follow ethical uh, principles, what's the point of giving it? We're going to talk about reliability, validity, impact, practicality, and authenticity, okay? All right, so first, let's talk about ethics. So I came up with, I, I read a bunch of things and I came up with a, what I thought was a pretty good definition for ethics. And these are beliefs that guide how we behave and how we treat each other. Um, they focus on right and wrong, and there's a perception of universality. A lot of people think ethics apply across the board, um, across all circumstances. So what does that mean for assessment? Um, there's an organization called the International Language Testing Association, of which I was secretary for six years, and we have a code of ethics. However, what we found is that a code of ethics is kind of, it's a very hypothetical document. So we also developed guidelines for practice, because ethics are what you do, and practice is how you put it into practice, right? Um, so th that's why there are these two documents. One is a code and the other are guidelines for how you use these, um, this code in everyday life in, in terms of assessment, okay? Um, and here's a quote there from it. In other words, the code focuses on the, on the ideals and the practice identifies requirements for practice in the profession, okay? So what is the ILTA Code of Ethics? Um, I do a whole workshop on this, so we're not gonna spend too much time on it, but I would feel remiss if I didn't share it with you. Um, these are just some highlights. Dignity of each test taker. Um, it, the second one is all about confidence and using professional judgment and sharing information, adhering to ethical principles within their own international and national context. This is very important, especially as you move maybe from state to state in teaching. Um, that we try not, that we work to avoid misuse of your knowledge and skills, and that we continue to develop our professional knowledge so that in the year 2017, we aren't still developing tests that would have been more used in 1984. Um, we all share the responsibility together of upholding the integrity of the language testing profession, and we try to improve quality of assessment, and we have to be mindful of our obligations within all um, the situations in which we work. And then we should always consider the potential effects um, of our projects and we reserve the right to withhold our professional services on the grounds of conscience. And this can sound like, oh, you know, I wouldn't interpret for somebody who was a mass murderer, but it can also mean, um, I don't agree with your uh, construct and I'm not going to work on your test, okay? So these are the code of ethics, which is also a half day workshop in two slides. The guidelines for practice are a little bit more practical, as you might imagine. They focus on the rights, the responsibilities, and the roles of everyone in, this, in assessment. Um, so we look at test developers, which include um, people who develop tests, people who design items, people who write items, people who design how the test is going to look from start to finish. And then the test users, which include institutions, test takers, and other individuals. Um, for those of you who teach in K-12 settings, parents are one of the users of tests, um, administrators at your school. So this applies to when you're using an outside test, right? That the test developers have used these uh, principles and these guidelines to develop their tests in an ethical manner. So as we talk about ethics, I want you to think about these things. Um, what ethical choices should be involved if you have the choice to select a test for students? And what ethical choices might not be involved? Um, another issue, which is one of my current areas of research, is, is what do test developers need to know about test takers when developing a test? So if you've always worked in higher education and you're suddenly moved in to work with kindergartners, you need to know a lot more about 
kindergartners than you currently do because you need to understand where they're coming from. Um, in addition, you need to think about how information can be conveyed in an understandable manner to speakers of non-majority languages. So if you're working in the US and you're developing language tests, how do you convey information about those tests to speakers of the non-majority language? And then finally, to think about how can technology improve or inhibit ethical assessment? I was once working on a test that was going from paper-based to computer, and we were trying it out with students, and we asked the students, oh, you know, how often do you use a computer? And one of the students said to us, oh, never. And we thought, oh, my goodness, we are not going to be able to get this test out. This is not right, blah, blah, blah. So we administer this test to the student, and at the end, we asked him or her, Oh, what was that like? Well, it reminded me of what I do at home. Oh, how's that? Oh, on my tablet. And we thought, oh, well, the kids have a different experience. We just didn't think about everything that it encompasses. So technology can improve, but it can also inhibit um, ethical assessment, for example, if students don't know how to take um, a test. So these are some things to think about as you move through the whole set of modules by the NFLRC. What are some of the ethical choices you're making? Okay, so now we're going to move from ethics to reliability. I know that was fast, but again, since you'll be getting a badge, you'll be able to, or hopefully you'll be pursuing a badge, you can go through and read these and think about how they apply. I think it's better to go back and read them too as you get into other topics. So the next topic is reliability. So a generic reliability perspective. I want all of you to think right now about if you say that someone or something is reliable, what does that mean? So I just gave some examples that your car starts on time and gets you to work. I can remember times when I did not have a reliable car, and that was a problem. Um, your child care provider arrives on time and follows instructions, a reliable child care provider. Um, reliable coworkers, they provide you what you need when they promise it. If they say they're gonna get you something at six o'clock, it's there on your desk at by 5.59 at the latest. Um, and another example of reliability that I was thinking about while I was working on this last week was your food delivery place gets your order to your house in the agreed upon time and at the right place. So it doesn't end up at your neighbors and they don't send you onion rings if you hate them and you didn't order them. So that's a generic perspective of reliability. What does that mean for language assessment? Oh, oh, and then the last one, your cat wakes you up at 1245 every morning because she wants attention. That's a reliable cat. Um, maybe not what you want, but you can set your watch by her. Okay, so reliable, uh, reliability, as these um, examples show, is really about consistency of results. How consistent is a test? Um, what does it mean that a test result is reliable? So have you ever gotten, some of you said that you were surprised by a test result. Does that mean maybe the test didn't seem reliable to you? Um, so some examples of test reliability, it gives the same person the same score in a reasonable period of time. And this gets into ethics and guidelines for practice. What's a reasonable period of time? Um, does it mean that um, it's a year apart with language? Probably not, a lot of language happens in a year. A week apart, if you're in an intensive language program, your score might change on a very fine-tuned test over a week. Um, so you need to make sure that the reliability is cued to what you're trying to assess. Um, Reliability is also that individuals with the same abilities, individuals who have the same amount of language, receive similar results regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, race, etc. So the test is set up so that it really gets at your language performance and it doesn't inhibit your performance based on any of these other things. And finally, that tests are administered reliably. And I'm going to give you some examples from the canon of some ways that tests have not been administered reliably. Okay, then let's talk about score reliability. Sometimes you have two different people scoring the same test. So maybe two teachers who are both scoring the same essay or listening to the same student speaking. So you want the two raters to give the same test the same rating. And this requires training and monitoring. And in language, I just can't stress how tricky this is and how hard it is um, to do this if you know the student and how important it is in high stakes tests to not know whom you're rating because very often I hear from teachers who say to me, well, I know Noah's a four. He's been in my class for X number of years and he can do this and this, and you look at his score and there he is hanging around a three. What's going on there? Maybe the teacher has some bias toward Noah. Maybe um, Noah didn't quite complete the task, but because you know the student, it can really color your ability to um, 
to rate reliably. Um, and I'm talking about situations outside of your own class, more high stakes like rating AP tests, which thank heavens, we don't know who the students are. Um, and this can be really tricky because language is such a dynamic thing. It's really hard sometimes to separate what you believe about language with the scale. So it's really important that two raters can give the same test the same rating. Okay, so I'm going to give you this first scenario and you can read it to yourself. So Ms. Ms. Rubio is developing and administering a Chinese language test to her first year students. And she notices that the morning students do a lot better than the afternoon class. So before I go on to some of the things that could have made a difference, what might contribute to this? Is it the test? Is it the students? Is it the teacher? Which of these variables contributed to it? So everybody think in your mind and I'm gonna give you some examples. Okay, so she's so concerned she sits and ponders. I love that word. So half of the students in her morning class participated in a three week summer Star Talk Chinese program. So even though all her students are first year, some of them came in with some more language. So maybe it's not right for her to expect the same results from them. So that has nothing to do with the test. It has to do with the students started starting at a different point. Now this might have to do with reliability. Um, the afternoon class has been interrupted by two fire drills since the start of school. If you've ever asked um, students to pick up after a fire drill, sometimes that can inhibit their performance. Um, plus, they might not have had enough time. Now, this is another one. This is not based on any true scenario that I've ever done, but she graded all of the writing portion on her porch between 5 and 7.30 in the evening, starting with the morning, morning classes papers. And for those of us who are starting to need reading glasses, and for those of us in the part of the world where it's starting to get darker, at six than it was a few weeks ago. Um, maybe she couldn't see very well and that, that would contribute to the reliability. These are all things that can go into reliability that we might not think about beyond, um, beyond the obvious. Then finally, she asked students to leave messages in her work voicemail and rated them as part of the test. Half of her students used a mobile phone provider that was experiencing difficulties that week. So maybe she had some trouble listening to them. So that introduced unreliability because she couldn't hear the students properly. So I'm just going to let you think about this and, and um, how this might have had an impact on the reliability of the test. Okay, so now we are going to move on to the second poll. Ready? Oh, you guys are the best. So why don't you quick take the poll and then we'll see the results. I'm not going to show you my answer. Oh, I have to vote. Hmm. I'm just voting for whatever. Okay, how are, how are our poll results coming there, Stephen? Just a moment. Okay, so let's look at this, great. Um, so the first one, a student arrives late for the test and miss, misses the first 15 minutes. So he didn't get the same amount of time as everybody, so his results might not be reliable. Um, the second one, um, Two raters review the speaking portions using a rubric and independently agree on the ratings. That would be even better if they had some training. Um, a computer-based test fizzles out in the middle of administration and half the data are lost. That would definitely have an impact on reliability because we don't know when we lost the student's data. I've heard of this happening in early phases of computer-based testing. A lot of that has been uh, fixed. And the fourth one is actually a real life example. I won't say where it happened or with what test, but there was a listening test that was administered in a large gymnasium and it echoed. And there were all these students trying to listen to it and take the test. First of all, I don't think a gymnasium is a great take place to take a large standardized test. So it echoed and echoing wasn't part of the construct of the test. 
And so the students didn't really understand. Um, they couldn't understand what was being said because of all the echoing. And so it just made the test really unreliable because the students who were sitting closer to the speakers could understand it and the students in the back couldn't. So it was a real, it was a real problem. Okay. So let's think for two minutes more on reliability. Here we go. And now we're going to move on to validity. Okay. So I want you to think about what you mean when you say that something isn't valid. I think we throw that word around and sometimes we don't really mean it in the way that it's used in testing. Um, and I want you to think about how often you think people use a test for a purpose other than its original one. Um, I want you to think about what contributes to your confidence that a test is being used appropriately. And then I want you to think about when you should start thinking about validity when you are designing or selecting a test. So validity is really the strength of an argument that you can make that the test is appropriate for the population in use. So that you're using a test that was developed for the right age group and the right kind of language. Um, it represents the language including the relevant structures and vocabulary of the language, okay? It shows how the language is used. Um, a test has been tried out with and normed on the appropriate population. So there was a test that was used in the United States for a long time that was developed um, when I was a kid about uh, 40 years ago, and it was tried out with a specific ESL population then. The ESL population changed, so you need to make sure that the test is normed or tried out on and compared to the current population of students. Um, the test is being used for an appropriate purpose, so you don't want to use a test for um, teacher certification with kindergartners. So let me give you some examples of validity. So Mr. Thomas teaches elementary school Spanish in a dual language program. To measure his students' progress in Spanish, he wants to use the Aprenda, which is used in Mexico with students of similar ages. Mr. Thomas teaches in the United States. This might not be a great example. Maybe his students um, are different from the students in Mexico. It wasn't developed for his students. So the test, we can't say it's not valid, but we can say it's not being used for a valid purpose. So Mr. Thomas should really rethink this. Um, and then Ms. Donlan, she wants to test her um, students' German speaking ability, but she teaches 130 students a week. And she decides instead of testing their speaking, she wants to see, give them a test to show that they know how well words rhyme instead. That's not really what she's getting at. So that's an example of a test that isn't really um, tapping into the validity. It's not really, you can't really make a good argument that say that if you know how well things rhyme, it means that you can speak well. And then Mr. Francis, who teaches fifth grade French to all the students at his school. Oh my goodness. Um, and they have 120 minutes of French per week. And he also teaches at the high school, um, which meets for 45 minutes every day. For those of us who are not math people, that's 225 minutes a week. And he plans to give students the same end of your essay. Um, so his re results here might be reliable, you know, he administers it, maybe he has some of his colleagues co-rate it with him. The results are very reliable, but they might not be valid. Fifth graders are different from high school students. The students are having a different teaching and learning experience. And so the, and moreover, you might not really ask fifth graders the same kinds of essay questions that you would ask high schoolers. Like you wouldn't ask fifth graders, um, you know, what are you planning to do um, when you graduate from high school? It might be a little early for that. So we should always think about the validity behind it and what kind of an argument you can make. So a lot of people ask, what's the difference between validity and reliability? So I like to use the example of a scale. A scale that is five points off is going to reliably show if you gain or lose weight according to your initial weight. So you're going to know if you gained or lost weight. But the weight, the number you receive isn't valid because it isn't calibrated correctly. So if you go into your doctor and say, I weigh 120 pounds, and the doctor doses you accordingly, so your doctor should really weigh you, um, that's not a valid weight, and that could have a serious ramification for your dosing, okay? So reliability is how consistent something is, and valid is what is it calibrated against? What does it mean, okay? So now we're gonna talk about validity as an argument. And in testing, we tend not to see validity as binary, meaning it's valid or it's not valid, but instead, what's the strength of the argument you can make? So there aren't really valid or invalid tests, but rather tests for which you can make a strong argument for their use, 
with a specific population for a specific purpose. So I never say that a test isn't valid. I say, you know, is this the right test? Can you make a good argument for using it? Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some types of assessment. We usually think of tests as being on a continuum of summative to formative. So if you think about summative versus formative, what does that mean? So here are some examples here. A high stakes might have a high impact on a grade or admissions or something. Um, it's, they tend to be less frequent. Um, they tend to be administered and rated by a teacher or another ent entity. And summative has the word summon it, meaning it's something that's added up. It's a culmination. Whereas formative can be very, very low stakes. So observing whether or not a student has understood something in class, it can be done frequently, as frequently as daily or, you know, moment by moment. It's almost always administered by the teacher or an aide and sometimes by the student themselves in self-assessment. It can be used to plan for the future. Oh my gosh, my students did not get the passe composé today. Let's review it tomorrow. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about impact. And the direct impact on assessment is with teachers and learnings. And I'm citing my friend Linda Taylor here, who's a great writer on assessment. The other impact can be on schools or programs or on society at large. Um, so how can test results have an impact on teachers, students, schools, programs, educational policy, and immigration? I think in the US we've seen tests having a lot of impact on these things. So just a little discussion. Imagine that there is a um, national study of student language outcomes among foreign language majors in the US. This is hypothetical. There hasn't been a study like this done. And the test shows um, that most of the majors are graduating and are, are unable to attain the proficiency needed to teach at the secondary level. So what impact might the results of this study and these tests have on higher education, secondary schools, elementary schools, teacher professional development and planning? So we would need to go back and say, this test showed us that there's a problem with how we're teaching languages or more likely how much time we spend learning languages. So testing can really have an impact on society at large and then that moves down to all aspects of it. Okay, the last thing um, I wanna talk about because I'm running short on time is impact, is, I'm sorry, practicality. And this I think is at the heart of it and that's why I left it till the end because we could talk about practicality all the time. So we always hear, I don't have, you know, our budget's been cut, we cannot afford to use this test. Um, but some other issues, is there space to administer the test to all the students who need to take it? So that gymnasium example is probably an example of some well-meaning person who said, let's throw them all in the gymnasium. They didn't think, oh, it's gonna echo. Um, what equipment is available? Does the test require headphones, computers, a microphone, and are these available? I once worked on a test where I went out and bought a whole bunch of um, earphones for students and it turned out that all the kids were carrying their own um, earbuds and we didn't really need them and it was it was great I went and returned a bunch of them uh, but I couldn't count on that I had to make sure that I had something available for all the students another issue is time um, traditionally a lot of the tests I've developed I've developed so that they can be administered in a 45 minute period of time because that's kind of one of the standards for a test for a, a class period um, and then you want to think about the staff. Are they qualified to administer a rate or score the test? Are they, and what does it take to be able to do this? So let's think about some applications. A middle school has decided to assess all their students at the end of seventh grade, which is when they teach first year language, using a test that was developed by a local university. And it will require an examiner who examines and rates the test, and a tester who administers and rates the test. The test will be administered on the weekend of Memorial Day, right before Memorial Day, with results ready for placement in courses for eighth grade by the beginning of June. So I imagine a lot of you are rolling your eyes and laughing because this is not very practical. A middle school is assessing all of their students, and it doesn't really matter if it's a big school or a little school, the personnel would be at a ratio that would make it equally difficult. You need two people for each test, it's going to be done before Memorial Day and it has to be ready by the beginning of June. And even when Memorial Day falls really early in the US, I can tell you that's a really short period of time. So this is an example of where practicality comes. Okay, so the third poll, have you ever felt constrained by time or budget? Yes or no? Oh, I'm gonna to vote too. 
Oh. All right. I think this is a quick one, huh, Stephen? Coming right up. All right, so I'd love to meet the 5% who said no. Um, but what I'd really like you to think about is you're not alone in this, and sometimes you have time, and sometimes you have budget, sometimes you don't have much of either. So you, you always need to think about um, what you have more of and how you can apply that to your testing situation. Hmm. All right, one second. The last thing I want to talk about real quick is authenticity. We often talk about authentic tests. Um, and the truth is a test is not really authentic because the best way to assess someone is to follow them around and see how they perform in the language and none of us can do this. So what we want to try to do is make them as authentic as possible. Um, using authentic materials, employing real life situations. Um, I always like to talk about the time I was asked to pretend I was reserving a hotel room. I was 14. Um, I'd never been to a hotel without my parents and I would have been completely embarrassed to talk to a hotel clerk. Um, so that was an example of not a real life situation. Now, if I'd been asked to go out and, you know, talk to a peer or um, order an ice cream, which is something another teacher had us do, um, that worked really well. And that the tasks and items are reviewed for authenticity. Um, and that it should be aligned with the student experience and language ability. I'm just going to give you a quick example. That Ms. Malone, we're going to get on her now. So she's teaching first year modern Greek. I don't know if we have any modern Greek teachers among us to middle school. And she expects them to read two articles from a Greek newspaper on the financial crisis and respond to questions for their final reading grade. So, very authentic, articles from a Greek newspaper. What's the issue here? It's too difficult for level one. Um, I'm not really sure, maybe you have very gifted middle schoolers, but um, I can assure you that my own daughter does not read about financial crisis in the newspaper. She prefers the sports section and the funnies. Um, and it's probably also not appropriate for first year. Um, that's probably not something um, you should be worried about. Um, and I would like to also point out that Ms. Malone might be the only person left in America who reads a paper newspaper, except all of you who are teachers and probably read one as well. So instead, she shares some clean and classroom appropriate text between middle school Greek students with her middle school students of Greek. They identify greetings, apologies, short interactions, and I said twice that she reviews them for appropriateness and topics covered in the class. Voila. Ms. Malone has been redeemed and her assessment is authentic. So that's a little better. So these are the six fundamental concepts that we went over and you're gonna be revisiting these over and over throughout all of these modules. Um, so this is just an introduction to them. I know it's a little bit of a whirlwind tour through assessment, but I promise you, if you do the reading and you just keep applying them and you come back and look at this, you will really get a, a really meaningful experience in this um, great set of modules with my great colleagues in Hawaii. Um, so as you move through, please apply these concepts.